In the late 1960s, the World Bank intervened in Ecuador with large loans. During the next 30 years, poverty grew from 50% to 70%. Under or unemployment grew from 15 to 70%. Public debt increased from 240 million to 16 billion, while the share of resources allocated to the poor went from 20% to 6%. In fact, by the year 2000, 50% of Ecuador's national budget had to be allocated for paying its debts. It is important to understand, the World Bank is, in fact, a U.S. bank, supporting U.S. interests. For the United States holds veto power over decisions, as it is the largest provider of capital. And where did it get this money? You guessed it. It made it out of thin air through the fractional reserve banking system. Of the world's top 100 economies, as based on annual GDP, 51 are corporations, and 47 of that 51 are U.S. based. Walmart, General Motors, and Exxon are more economically powerful than Saudi Arabia, Poland, Norway, South Africa, Finland, Indonesia, and many others. And, as protective trade barriers are broken down, currencies tossed together and manipulated in floating markets, and state economies overturned in favor of open competition and global capitalism, the empire expands. You get up on your little 21-inch screen and howl about America and democracy. There is no America. There is no democracy. There is only IBM and ITT and AT&T and DuPont, Dow, Union Carbide and Exxon. Those are the nations of the world today. What do you think the Russians talk about in their councils of state? Karl Marx? They get out their linear programming charts. Statistical decision theories, min and max solutions, and compute the price cost probabilities of their transactions and investments, just like we do. We no longer live in a world of nations and ideologies, Mr. Beale. The world is a college of corporations, inexorably determined by the immutable bylaws of business. The world is a business, Mr. Beale. the world is being taken over by a handful of business powers who dominate the natural resources we need to live while controlling the money we need to obtain these resources. The end result will be world monopoly based not on human life but financial and corporate power. And as the inequality grows naturally more and more people are becoming desperate. So the establishment was forced to come up with a new way to deal with anyone who challenges the system. So they gave birth to the terrorist. The term terrorist is an empty distinction, designed for any person or group who chooses to challenge the establishment. This isn't to be confused with the fictional Al-Qaeda, which was actually the name of a computer database for the US-supported Mujahideen in the 1980s. In 2007, the Department of Defense received $161.8 billion for the so-called Global War on Terrorism. According to the National Counterterrorism Center, in 2004, roughly 2,000 people were killed internationally due to supposed terrorist acts. Of that number, 70 were American. Using this number as a general average, which is extremely generous, it is interesting to note that twice as many people die from peanut allergies a year than from terrorist acts. 
Concurrently, the leading cause of death in America is coronary heart disease, killing roughly 450,000 each year. And in 2007, the government's allocation of funds for research on this issue was about $3 billion. This means that the U.S. government in 2007 spent 54 times the amount for preventing terrorism than it spent for preventing a disease which kills 6,600 times more people annually than terrorism does. Yet, as the name terrorism and Al-Qaeda are arbitrarily stamped on every news report relating to any action taken against U.S. interests, the myth grows wider. In mid-2008, the U.S. Attorney General actually proposed that the U.S. Congress officially declare war against the fantasy. Not to mention, as of July 2008, there are now over one million people currently on the U.S. terrorist watch list. These so-called counterterrorism measures, of course, have nothing to do with social protection and everything to do with preserving the establishment amongst the growing anti-American sentiment both domestically and internationally, which is legitimately founded on the greed-based corporate empire expansion that is exploiting the world. The true terrorists of our world do not meet at the docks at midnight or scream Allah Akbar before some violent action. The true terrorists of our world wear $5,000 suits and work in the highest positions of finance, government, and business. So, what do we do? How do we stop a system of greed and corruption that has so much power and momentum? How do we stop this aberrant group behavior which feels no compassion for, say, the millions slaughtered in Iraq and Afghanistan, so the corporatocracy can control energy resources and opium production for Wall Street profit? How do we stop a system of greed and corruption that condemns poor populations to sweatshop slavery for the benefit of Madison Avenue? Or that engineers false flag terror attacks for the sake of manipulation? Or that generates built-in modes of social operation which are inherently exploitative? Or that systematically reduces civil liberties and violates human rights in order to protect itself from its own shortcomings? How do we deal with the numerous covert institutions such as the Council on Foreign Relations, the Trilateral Commission, and the Bilderberg Group, and other undemocratically elected groups which, behind closed doors, collude to control the political, financial, social, and environmental elements of our lives? In order to find the answer, we must first find the true underlying cause. For the fact is, the selfish, corrupt, power and profit based groups are not the true source of the problem. They are symptoms. My name is Jock Fresco. I'm an industrial designer and a social engineer. I'm very much interested in society in developing a system that might be sustainable for all people. First of all, the word corruption is a monetary invention. That aberrant behavior 